perhaps want to start with evolutionary psychology. Um, I don't know a huge amount about it, but I know it's a relatively new discipline compared to many other disciplines. Could you just give the sort of potted history explainer of what evolutionary psychology is? Conceptually, evolutionary psychology is just trying to understand human nature. Human nature in terms of what challenges our ancestors faced in prehistory. How did they survive? How did they find mates? How did they reproduce, raise kids, find food, all of that? So we try to understand a lot of that from archaeology, anthropology, hunter-gatherer studies, behavior genetics, etc. Emotionally, though, evolutionary psychology, I think, is basically respect for our ancestors. It's realizing that we're descended from a long line of successful people and pre-people, you know, hominids and animals. And it's paying attention to what did they do that worked and what strategies would have succeeded or failed and kind of thinking really hard about that. So for me, it's been partly a scientific journey of figuring out human nature, but emotionally and maybe even politically, it's been a process of kind of reconnecting with my ancestors. And I think everybody who works in the field for more than you know, a decade or two has both of those components to it. And you mentioned uh, politically then. It's, it's really interesting because you're, you've written for Quillette. You're kind of in this, I've seen you on Twitter, you're kind of in this intellectual dark web conversation. Um, and is that somewhere that you've always been or is that partly because of what you've, the journey you've been on through your work? I think it's partly a scientific journey, partly it's a sort of personal experiences of run-ins with social justice activists or certain kinds of trouble. Partly it's just maturing and having certain experiences as a man, as a dad, you know, as a partner. I mean, I started out college pretty standard lefty. I actually joined the Men's Feminist Union freshman year at Columbia. And I had pretty standard liberal slash libertarian views. Like, I was in the era of Reagan being president in America. And I was completely appalled that he got reelected in 84 when I was in college. Like, how could anybody vote for this actor, right? And then my journey since then has been partly kind of being radicalized as a libertarian in grad school. And then getting just kind of increasingly appreciative of certain kinds of traditionalist and conservative views, but also getting kind of radicalized even farther left on other issues. So it's a kind of complicated patchwork. And it, it does seem that in this sort of network around Quillette, uh, around this kind of conversation, that there are quite a lot of evolutionary biologists, uh, evolutionary psychologists. Is this because of the nature of the discipline, you think? I think the discipline makes you very wary of certain kinds of claims that come out of the left, like the mind is a blank slate and we can completely re-engineer men and women according to whatever happens to be politically correct. We get very skeptical about that. Um, I think partly at the moment it's the people who are actually willing to do evolutionary psychology have to have extremely thick skins and have to be prepared to really battle for their ideas in an academic environment that's largely hostile to them and really punishes and stigmatizes them. So I think it kind of selects for certain um, ornery personality types. Evolutionary psychology, can you just summarize what it is for people who don't know? Because I, I understand it's a relatively new discipline. Yeah, it's mostly just an excuse to go back to 1950s gender roles to keep women barefooted pregnant. I knew honestly. it. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's a lens with which to view human psychology. So it's a way of generating hypotheses and predictions based on what would have been adaptive. So we think about things in a variety of different ways. And so if you, even if you saw a robot in the desert and you saw that it was moving around and you saw that it had survived there for some years, you would know that it had certain features. You would know that it was resistant to sand erosion. You would know that it was able to actually use the sun potentially to power itself. You would know it had certain characteristics. And we know just 
on the basis that humans have survived on Earth for many millions of years in our current form and in other forms and have reproduced, that we have certain characteristics and that we lived in groups and that we lived you know, for some period of time on the African savanna and all of these different things lead us to have some idea about how human psychology might function. If you were going to design a program in order to survive and reproduce, to attract mates, to increase your status, to engage socially, to help get other people to help you and to help others, what kinds of programs would you implement in order to make those things happen? And evolutionary psychology thinks about things from that perspective, but also from a biological and ecological perspective, looking at humans kind of as animals. I think that one of the main things that happen, and people as you know, diverse as you know, B.F. Skinner and ethologists and evolutionary psychologists think that in some sense we're too close to our own minds to have a good idea of what we really think. And many of the people who have come up with these amazing insights into human condition were people who were like, you know, what, what Oliver Sacks called anthropologists on Mars, people who felt alienated from other humans. They were trying to figure them out. And they were able to think about things in a novel way, in a foreigner kind of way. Uh, because they didn't actually feel entirely human. And I think that evolutionary psychology tries to have an objective perspective on human minds in that way as well. Yeah. Because you mentioned at the beginning, I mean, kind of joking about kind of wanting women to return to the kitchen, but there is, an, like, when there is suspicion around maybe evolutionary biology as well, but evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, it is that by looking at differences between men and women, what we're actually doing is wanting to go back to the 1950s, for example. Why, how do you sort of respond to that criticism? I just think when you look at most evolutionary psychologists, they talk about things yeah, like hunter-gatherer life, like non-human animals. There's really no moralizing at all around it. Now there's some people who are kind of neo-traditionalists who talk about evolutionary psychology as a way to bolster some claims. But certainly human beings were not monogamous at all. And there was certain, um, you know, men mostly had uh, or at least some high status men had multiple mates and that's not anything that people are arguing for even though that's what you might argue from an evolutionary perspective because 80% of all societies have been polygynous. So how I would respond to that claim is yes, yeah, some people use evolutionary psychology to bolster that traditionalist view but then you also have people like Christopher Ryan trying to use evolutionary psychology to bolster the view that we should all have multiple lovers and that we should all be polyamorous. And it's a little bit like the Bible in that sense. You can kind of use it to bolster what claims you want. But I think all of these people get certain things wrong. I think Christopher Ryan gets a lot of things wrong. I think Jordan Peterson gets things wrong. Brett Weinstein about evolution and how humans have evolved, especially in terms of romantic relationships. And I remember on the Rubin Report, you talked about that there are certain topics that you're wary about teaching. What are those topics? And are they ones that you don't teach anymore or you're just a lot more cautious about the way you teach them? Some of them I don't really touch at all because there's almost no right way to approach them. So for example, trans issues, transsexuality. I've taught a human sexuality class for about 20 years. Um, I know a reasonable amount about trans issues, but you know, if you have a class of 100 students and there's even one or two who have been radicalized into a certain view of trans issues and trans rights, and I give a lecture about it, and it's not pitch perfect in terms of what I say, I can get into big trouble about that. On the other hand, if I talk about things like the history of gay rights, I'm totally comfortable with that because I can say things that are factually correct. I was actually, you know, in New York as an undergrad when ACT UP and the AIDS crisis hit, and I'm very familiar with what a challenge that was to, to gay people. I'm totally comfortable talking about um, polyamory, open relationships, BDSM, kink, lots of that stuff. But then when you get into things like sex differences and personality traits or cognitive strengths, then I have to tread quite carefully again. There seems to be an all-out attack on, on gender per se in some areas of, of the left at the moment. And I guess if you're studying innate gender differences, then you're in the, in the crosshairs. It's a really weird moment in relations between the sexes where 
on the one hand, you get a kind of wholesale denial of sex differences by a lot of the left. On the other hand, you get a demonization of men, right? Like everything that's wrong in history is due to men and patriarchy. And it's almost like, on the other hand, on the one hand, there are no essential sex differences. On the other hand, the core essential sex difference is men are evil. And I don't know how we're going to reconcile those views, but it makes for a very difficult kind of intellectual landscape to navigate at the moment. And you mentioned masculinity, and some people have called it a war on masculinity. At the very least, we have a war about masculinity, I think you could kind of safely say. And a big part of that recently seems to have been, I mean, the Gillette ad caused a lot of response, but in a way, the APA guidelines that came close to pathologizing traditional masculinity were in some ways more concerning. Would you, what, what did you make of those at the time? Yeah, the Gillette ad, at the end of the day, is just an ad. It's just a consumer campaign that's sort of woke capital. It's just taking social justice concerns and trying to monetize them and trying to reposition the Gillette brand, given that it's being challenged by kind of new rising hipster brands like Harry's. On the other hand, the APA Division 51 guidelines that they published a couple months ago are concerning because APA has the power to tell every clinical psych grad program in America how to teach certain issues. Like, we actually face APA accreditation in my department. We train most of the clinical psychologists who practice in the state of New Mexico in the US. And so whatever APA says is kind of a, um, is a top-down ideological you know, mandate. And if they have a view of, here's how to treat male clients when they come to you, that's how clinicians will be trained to deal with men. And I think what they've done is appalling, disgraceful, anti-masculine, and outrageous. And when they got the blowback, they didn't say, oh my gosh, we should be a little humbler about this, we should rethink this. No, they doubled down. And they said, we know best, we know the research. And I was like, have you guys read any evolutionary psychology or animal behavior, anything about evolved sex differences? No, they don't make any reference to that because it's not in their world worldview. So I think that's where you get the danger that there might be you know, millions of American men going to individual therapy, couples therapy, marital therapy, family therapy. Most psychotherapists are women who don't have a very deep understanding of masculinity. And these guys are going to be kind of hung out to dry by this therapy industry. Could you, for people who maybe weren't familiar with the, with the furore when it exploded, could you explain what happened and why it was so dangerous in your view? I think the short answer is basically APA Division 51 guidelines said for a man to succeed in psychotherapy, he basically has to become more like a woman. He has to get more in touch with his feelings, share more of his secrets, be more empathic. He has to get away from any historical archetypes of masculinity, right? He can't act like a hunter, a warrior, anything Jordan Peterson would advocate guys should be like. And he basically has to purge himself of any hint of traditional masculinity and adopt what? 21st century femininity or some as yet undiscovered form of masculinity that nobody even knows how to do therapy about. So I think that's the danger, that it basically delegitimizes the kinds of masculinity that I think are actually most helpful, particularly to young men. And what are those types of masculinity? I think getting in touch with, um, <clears throat> getting in touch with your sexuality, your sexual desires, your, the ways that you view women, trying to make those both consistent with your evolved desires, but also kind of find your ethical path towards being open, honest, respectful towards women. I think it means 
finding a way to reconnect with other men through friendship, through groups, through sports, particularly combat sports. Um, it means, yeah, getting in touch with the, the inner hunter, warrior, husband, father, um, all of that. And of course we have to reinvent that to some degree for the 21st century. But I think it's really useful to start with a fairly traditionalist view of a lot of those roles. And that's what APA was, was rejecting. So does traditional therapy not work so well for men? Is it more oriented towards a woman's uh, way of being in the world? Yeah, I mean, Freud invented psychotherapy mostly to deal with female patients, to deal with fairly neurotic, unhappy, depressed, anxious, Viennese, bourgeois women, and to talk with them about their issues. And I think for women, talking about your issues, particularly with um, your female friends um, or your sometimes your male mate can be good therapy. I think for a lot of men, in a way the last thing they want to do is talk about their vulnerabilities and their neuroses, particularly with a woman. I think it's often humiliating. I think it's often counterproductive. Um, it seems like if a guy is going to do individual psychotherapy, on the one hand, it might be more productive to do it with a guy who actually understands you. On the other hand, most guys now are actually more comfortable sharing their secrets with a woman because women are like better listeners and they're more used to that. So the whole therapy industry, I think, is deeply dysfunctional when it comes to dealing with male clients, I think it's often pretty good at dealing with female clients. So how does evolutionary psychology influence what your view of masculinity was? What, what lessons can we learn from evolutionary psychology about this topic? I think a lot. I mean, to me, the, the more you understand evolution and biology and animal behavior and ancestry and hunter-gatherer lifestyles, the better you can connect with your, your true nature as a man, and the better you can understand your sort of path from puberty through young adulthood to maturity and fatherhood and becoming a mentor and, and so forth. I think to understand your sexuality when you're an adolescent male, it, it's virtually impossible if you don't know some animal behavior and you don't understand how sexual selection shapes males and females differently, and how it's done that for at least you know, 4,000 species of mammals and 300 species of primates, and that this is really deep stuff, and it's kind of um, programmed into us to do things like seek sexual variety, sexual novelty. Um, it's not necessarily about you know, spreading your seed in kind of a simple-minded way, like every man wants to be an alpha Genghis Khan. It's not that simple. But to a first approximation, that's closer to the truth than what most young men are taught, right? Which is that all of your sexual desires are basically ethically illegitimate. And you should act more like girls in high school. And, you know, What else helps? I think understanding status seeking and how male status works and how like, there's different kinds of status that you can seek. There's formidability, which is are you physically capable of fighting and sort of overcoming men? There's dominance, which is more about your attitude and how you carry yourself, how you talk to other people, particularly other men. There's status, which is how respected are you, have people heard of you. There's prestige, which is what do you know? Do people want to hear from you and learn from you? All these different things, young men confuse them. Like they don't know, they don't know the difference between formidability in terms of like winning a jujitsu match versus prestige, which is people seeking you out for advice. Um, so I think understanding sexuality, understanding status seeking, that's just two examples where an evolutionary viewpoint really buys, buys you a lot. And obviously you're looking a lot at the 
differences between men and women and what do you make of the way that conversation looks at the moment in say the media and the culture yeah well obviously there's a lot of very adversarial kinds of conversations happening in different kinds of subcultures so there is a sort of radical feminist movement that has a view of men as being yeah really bad and, and bad actors generally but this impression that they have is that men are bad actors and they're toxic. There's toxic, toxic masculinity, masculinity, I can't even say it, because of the way that men have been socialized. And men are socialized by women. So I actually don't understand in that whole, you know, how that all would work. And then there's also, you know, pickup artist and red pill kinds of communities, which also have a kind of adversarial relationship to women, which in some sense they're talking about trying to get one over on women. So if men are trying to maximize the amount of sex they can have and minimize investment, women are trying to maximize investment and give away as little sex as possible. And if you look at rap music, which is one of my favorite sources for thinking about evolutionary psychology, you see this kind of interaction a lot, this kind of battle of the sexes interaction. And if you look at those kinds of men, they're kind of trying to get one over on women. And in some sense, the radical feminists are trying to get one over on men, but by saying that they are bad actors and that there's toxic uh, masculinity. So that's all happening. And then I think the average person who's trying to engage with the opposite sex, they don't know how much of their desires, how much of what they're trying to do with one another is socialized, how much they should reinvent things or how much they should go along with how they've been socialized or how they feel most naturally to act. And you know, I have some friends who have been in radical leftist communities, and they tried to forge a new relationship kind of from the ground up, tried to negotiate who was going to do each task, tried to really challenge sex differences in their own relationship. And it caused us a tremendous amount of strain and argument. And sex roles, you know, wherever you think they come from, are actually very valuable for saving time and reducing the amount of stuff that you have to negotiate about. They get a really bad rap. So I think there's a lot of confusion. And there's also this adversarial dynamic that really doesn't need to be there. And you mentioned the idea of toxic masculinity. Like there's a huge discussion around toxic masculinity in the culture. And there's very little discussion of toxic femininity. And maybe we need to ditch both of those terms, but uh, we did a really interesting interview with Heather Hying where she talked about that. And it's been one of the most popular pieces we've put out. So there's clearly a hunger for at least a discussion of the other side of the, the coin. Yeah. What do you think the other side of the coin is? There is, I think, I mean, toxic masculinity is a little bit easier to pick up because I think that men have tried to achieve status and dominance in a more narrow way. So they've had to achieve that with physical strength, with aggression, and also, yeah, subjugation. So all of that is ways that men have made a living for millions of years. Whereas I think the way that women have made a living is more through psychological means. You could call it manipulation or you could call it, you, know, you could just call it manipulation. And so when I saw that piece, she was saying it's toxic femininity to say that, uh, to tell a man that he shouldn't look at an attractive woman or to tell men that they shouldn't engage in shows of strength or shows of dominance, that they shouldn't kind of do what's coming naturally to them. I would think of toxic femininity in another way, which is the same way that men are sometimes driven to manipulate others through strength, dominance, and aggression. Women are often inclined to manipulate others through psychological means, through manipulation, through insults and carrots and sticks and engaging in reputational damage. And women have you know, some women more than others, obviously, there's huge individual differences in this respect, have a real map of everybody's relationship to them, who owes them what. And, and you see this kind of thing, and I would call that maybe the other side of the coin of toxic femininity, which is this desire to control others. And you could see some ideological changes, for example, this desire that there would be parity in every different scientific domain as a way of actually engaging in manipulation that will improve the law. Of, of women. So that's what I think maybe the other side of the coin, toxic femininity, this you know, desire to manipulate things to one's own end, especially in, in close social relationships. And it seems that that, like even that definition, that kind of discussion feels quite countercultural at the moment. Like there isn't much yeah. of a discussion about it in the media or in, in the culture at large. Why do you think that is? Well, 
you can, it, it's very hard to spin, uh, I'm engaging in dominance against you and aggressiveness against you, as in, this is for your own good. But obviously there's a lot of ways to spin other kinds of psychological manipulation as this is actually the best thing for the culture, this is the best thing for the in-group, this is the best thing for people's relationships with one another. So if you look at therapy culture in that men should be more revealing of their weakness and vulnerabilities and they should talk out their problems more often, for example, that is a way of saying, men, you could be better and happier and more psychologically healthy if you engaged in this thing. Another way of thinking about it is actually a way of trying to whittle away at the, th the ways that men feel most comfortable engaging with the world and engaging socially, right? You had, there's a very easy way to put a positive spin on it. And if you had a very cynical view about what's actually happening in the culture, then it's obviously easy to turn that on you and say that you're a misogynist or that you're anti-feminist in a way that it's not easy to, to turn on somebody who says aggressiveness is bad, which people tend to agree with. Have you been described as an anti-feminist? I've been described as an anti-feminist, yeah. And uh, I think I've even been described as engaging in casual misogyny, which I like better than formal misogyny, you know, you can wear your sweatpants. Mm -hmm. And what did you make of that when it happened? Why, why did it happen and what did you make of it? Yeah, I've been called an anti-feminist. I, I don't, I, I mean, the kinds of things that people hurl at you and in, hominem, in an ad hominem way, I don't really think about them very much. They're not very sophisticated criticisms. So I, I think that as an evolutionary psychologist, generally because it's such a controversial field and because I've worked on some controversial problems, I have a fairly thick skin anyway. And it's very easy for me to ignore somebody's unsophisticated commentary. But also I grew up in a culture and in a family where we were constantly arguing, where we were constantly engaging in lighthearted ribbing, insulting each other. And I think that that has possibly also been very good preparation, even though I didn't know it at the time, for the world of you know, the internet and Twitter, where people say awful things all the time, but it can be very funny if that's all they have to say. I guess the, the issue is that when, especially people on the left, hear people talk about an evolutionary viewpoint, what they hear is, we have to go back to pre-1950s gender relations. Mm -hmm. I think that's a willful misreading of what evolutionary psychologists are talking about. So there's the stereotype that says, oh, me and David Boss and Bob Trivers and whoever else does evolutionary psychology just wants to recreate 50s gender roles. No serious evolutionist I know sort of advocates that as like, the default, because we know hunter-gatherer societies are really, really different from suburban America, right? We lived in tribal groups, we had multiple friends, we did shared childcare, people didn't do monogamous marriage for life, they did form pair bonds, but, you know, sexual relations were, were more fluid. Um, the men didn't go off, like, 40 hours a week hunting. They were around quite a bit and then they would go off on multi-day hunting trips and then come back and the women would not stay like in a cave. They would go off foraging and some of them would stay back and look after kids. So nobody's advocating 50s suburban America as some evolutionary default. That is a fiction of the left that is created purely to dis evolutionary psychology. And you were one of the people who wrote in defense of James Damore. Yeah. I think that was Quillette's kind of breakthrough article back in 2017, would it have been? Sounds right. Sounds about then. Um, and James Damore was a really very interesting moment because it was, I'm sure it kind of put a huge fear of God into just about everyone inside the tech industry. And I think still is a really important cultural moment what did, you, what did you make of that and what do you think it shows about kind of the media and cultural landscape that we're, that we're in at the moment? So I wrote sort of a very short thing for Quillette that basically said James Damore is factually correct about most of his claims about sex differences. And then I wrote a longer piece called The Neurodiversity Case for Free Speech that pointed out, look, James Damore is kind of aspy, like he's got some Asperger's syndrome traits, which is like he loved systematizing information. 
he's not naturally that empathic with people of other views. He can be a bit blunt in how he says things. I'm Aspie, I totally relate to that. And I basically said, we as a society have to choose, do we censor every Aspie person from saying what they really think and making them super cautious? Or do we give them a little slack to say what they really think and, and to expect sometimes they will get it wrong or they'll be a little tone deaf or you know maybe they'll be a little bit over systematizing in terms of like well this is what the facts say so these are the policy implications. The response to Demore I think from the left from the social justice activist was basically Aspie shut the fuck up we don't want to hear from you. If you can't toe the line about what we consider appropriate ideologies, then you are not welcome in the public sphere. And I think all the, you know, all the Aspie guys in the tech industry heard that message loud and clear. And some of them were like, to hell with you, we're going to say what we want anyway. But most of them buckled and were like, okay, I guess that's the professional landscape we face. And what do you make of the kind of the media, what you might call the media consensus around sex differences, around these kind of topics? I think what you see in the media consensus is a generation of journalists who are denied any access to any understanding of evolution or biology or animal behavior. Right? What do journalists major in? Communications and journalism. Who is teaching them? People who don't know anything about biology. So they're getting indoctrinated into a certain view of the world that they think is natural, that they think is the, the correct default way to understand everything. And when they encounter someone who has not been socialized into the same beliefs, they're kind of shocked. And, you know, and the irony is what these people learn in communications and journalism is concepts like hegemony where like here's how you run a society you instill certain ideological beliefs in the elites and then those take over and those are the unquestioned wisdom and they're enacting exactly that theory of, of social control without even realizing that they're the sort of um, <clears throat> witless accomplices to that and how do you train your boyfriend Easily, no. <laughs> um, how do I train my boyfriend? Well, the kind of how to train your boyfriend idea is the idea that women actually have this faculty psychologically with figuring out what other people find reinforcing and punishing and doling out those rewards and punishments in a way that works in their own best self-interest, both with women and with men. And the idea there is that men have actually been less inclined to develop these sophisticated psychological means with which to control others and control their relationships because they had a simpler mechanism at their disposal which was basically physical force. And so, yeah, I, I, my idea is essentially that women find this very easy to do, to use rewards and punishments to control others, but that they actually should be thinking more consciously about what they're trying to get out of their relationships with other people. And if you're unwilling to admit to yourself that you're manipulative, then you're going to be, you're going to be manipulating others in ways that you don't want and towards ends that you don't want and even in ways that are counterproductive to good and healthy relationships. And what do you think, if, if what we're seeing at the moment in the culture looks a lot like a kind of dysfunctional relationship between men and women, what does a healthy relationship look like? I think a good, healthy relationship, not just romantic relationships, but other kinds of relationships, including between mothers and, and children and between friends, is one where we can actually be skeptical about our own psychology. So for me, I sometimes have an instinct or a desire to punish somebody. I will feel angry with somebody and I will try and figure out why, from an evolutionary perspective, what they did was abrasive to me and try and figure out actually what I want and whether I can get there through an argument or through being angry or through talking it out. Sometimes even talking things out is not going to be especially helpful. 
And so in, I think, good romantic heterosexual relationships do involve some understanding about male and female evolved psychology. So for example, men and women tend to have different kinds of jealousy. Women are more emotionally jealous on average. Men are more sexually jealous on average. And if I expected my partner to exhibit exactly the same kinds of stress and anxiety when it came to our relationship, if I was saying, why can't you be more like me? And I thought that everything was socialized, I actually would be trying to manipulate him much more to be like me. And I would have a much more difficult time understanding where he was coming from than I do currently. Uh, another thing is, you know, for example, just speaking personally, I've been in a long distance relationship for some time. And when we get back together, it's always difficult because I don't understand that we had to be apart because our career's in different places. I treat him as if he chose to be away from me and as if he abandoned me and then came back. There's a part of me that's treating him that way that wants to punish him even though he's just been reintroduced back into my life. And so by thinking about parts of my mind as programs or thinking about actually myself as an animal that has trying to maximize, for example, the investment of my partner, it actually helps me be skeptical of my own motivations and my own feelings in a way that you know, I can be gentle with myself, I understand where I'm coming from, but I can also be skeptical of myself that I don't have to express everything that I feel because I know it doesn't always come from a place that's trying to maximize the benefit to the relationship and the stability of that relationship. And we've talked a little bit about the, I mean you could call it a kind of ideological capture in the media and there are certain topics that we've seen with Jordan Peterson for example just even trying to talk about innate differences between men and women creates a huge backlash. I have a sense, especially running a YouTube channel and being kind of increasingly exposed to the online world and what you might call the manosphere, that that conversation seems to go toxic very quickly. Um, what, have you ex experienced much of it and why do you think it goes so toxic? And wh what, what genuine um, insights do you think are being held in that kind of red pill manosphere culture? Yeah, it's really sad because on the one hand you have this sort of oppressive political correctness that says these topics are all out of bounds or at least you can't talk about them in certain ways. Okay, so then young men go, fuck you, we're gonna talk about them anyway. And we're gonna go on Reddit and overshare everything about our lives. And we are young and angry and pissed off and we don't trust the dominant culture and we don't trust what we're being told, and we don't even trust scientists anymore because most of them have been captured ideologically. So you get these um, kind of online gangs who think that like we are the righteous rebels who are like challenging the feminized culture, and they're sort of 50% correct about that but then they're 50% delusional because they go down these weird rabbit holes where, for example, I'll often see in the manosphere explanations of sexual selection that I kind of recognize as like fourth hand echoes of my mating mind book from 20 years ago that's been sort of circuitously reinterpreted by various red pill guys and pickup artists and whatever. And then if I wade into those debates and I say, you know, actually this comes from this and this source and this is from Darwin and this, but this other thing is wrong. Then you get dogpiled by these angry young men who are like, you don't know anything, man. You're like, you're not in the manosphere. And so it's a very weird moment. What are the most dangerous? Are there any specifics that you can think about that they misinterpret and it, it does them no good to do so? I think there's a lot of sexual shame, particularly around masturbation, pornography. Um, you know, there's the no fat movement that says like young men should never masturbate. That's like every juvenile male primate masturbates and has done for millions of years. Like teenagers masturbate, 99% of male teenagers. Like that's totally normal. And if you deny that and you impose shame on young men for that, you're totally playing into the hands of far left feminists.
who are basically taking male sexuality and saying this is entirely toxic and bad. Um, the anti-porn movement, like, yeah, you shouldn't watch porn like more than 20 hours a week. That seems reasonable. Like, that might interfere with your job. But um, the idea that, like, it's more dangerous than crack or heroin and that it will create this like it'll drive you insane and it's incredibly habit forming like the scientific research says no that's wrong that's not what happens but if you argue with these guys about that they are so invested in in not believing anything that mainstream science says and i totally understand why they're skeptical that they'll they'll kind of jump at you um, and that's terrible because it means you, they're not in a position to distinguish between what is actually evidence-based and real versus what pretends to be evidence-based and real but is actually ideologically captured. And the, the kind of stuff that you study and teach is right at the center of the culture war at the moment. What, do you have a sense of what a place of integration looks like? Is it kind of accepting that we have differences, but also knowing that we can change them or that we have the ability to repurpose the hardware? What's the, what's the integration beyond the culture war? I think before we get to a point of integration, there has to be a period of radical experimentation. It's 2019. Nobody has any idea what the hell we're doing in terms of what a viable relationship will look like that could last until 2050 or 2070 or however long we'll live if we get regenerative medicine. Nobody has any idea. We know lifelong monogamous marriage probably works okay for some people, but not everybody, right? We know polyamory works for some people, but not everybody. We know whatever, hot wifing and, and swinging works for some people, but not everybody. I think we need to just cut everybody a lot of slack and sort of say, let's, let's allow e each of these little subcultures to flourish. And each of them needs to be like radically honest about what are the pros and cons of what they're doing, how generalizable is it to everybody else, what can we, what are the lessons learned from these different things? And so I, I guess I'm quite humble about, I, I don't know what's going to work in the 21st century, but nobody else does either. And I think we just have to experiment. We don't know how human nature is actually going to interact with social media and smartphones and contraception and modern education and modern careers and you know vast cities and all of that stuff. So I think everybody should be pretty cautious about like preaching to others. Like I love Jordan Peterson, huge respect to him, but I don't think he should be going around saying, well, we should all be monogamous just because it worked for a few thousand years. Well, yeah, it worked under conditions that are radically different from today. Some aspects of that will still work, some of it might not. Some of it might need minor tweaking, some of it might need complete rethinking. We actually don't really pay that much attention to other polyamorous people because we think that a lot of what other polyamorous people endorse is actively harmful. I actually don't understand how people do polyamory without an evolutionary perspective, for example, and that is something that we're planning on exploring more and writing and in videos, yeah.